Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 Good to see you. Hey, uh, when you get a chance, I could use a table for my laptop if, if somebody could bring me up one. Uh, so we're in a series on, um, on uh, building relational bridges. Thus, we have our bridge up here. It's kind of our theme uh, stage design. To kind of, thank you very much, Ed, to, to remind uh, all of us, you know, that, that bridges take effort. And, uh, and it's, you know, in any kind of relationship, you're going to, you're going to get hurt, right? People hurt us intentionally. They hurt us unintentionally. Reminds me of the guy, he's older and he, uh, his, hear, his hearing starts to go. So he goes to the doctor, he's going deaf and the doctor goes, I think I can help you with that. So he does some treatments and his hearing comes back. So he, he says, I bet your family, and the, like the last treatment, he goes, I bet your family's real happy that you can hear again. He goes, well, I haven't told them. He goes, well, why in the world have you not told your family you've got your hearing back? He goes, well, I'm just listening to all the conversations, and I've already changed my will three times. <laughs> so people, right, they're going to hurt us. They're going to say things that, that, uh, that make us angry. That, and here's the problem is that if hurt's inevitable, right? But the problem is when we let hurt turn into resentment, that becomes uh, a different issue. So we want to make sure and uh, not let that happen because it can happen, especially with people that are close to us, right? I mean, and, and people will say, hey, I don't, I don't have any more feelings for her. I don't love him anymore. What's wrong with me? And here's the problem. Often it's just resentment. We got hurt. We didn't deal with it well. It turned into resentment and then it starts to affect how we feel, how we act. Now, the good news is there is a pathway out. We're going to get hurt, but not letting it turn into resentment certainly is an option. And we see this in the Bible, and we're going to look at that. Notice with me here, um, it says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Now, we, we talked about this verse last week, and it's a great theme verse. It certainly is a verse that we want to consider today because it says, hey, if you're keeping a record, you know, then chances are that turns a record becomes a grudge a grudge becomes a resentment resentment can actually turn into hatred i mean it's just there's no limit to this thing so and if you're in a relationship with somebody and you've got like uh some ammo a list of ammo that you that you need you know that that you can use whenever you need it that's not a loving thing to do you know so keeping your little your little box of all of the offenses is really just going to get in the way of you and, uh, you know, the best relationship you can have. So what I want to do is I want to look at a guy named Job. Now, you might be familiar with Job. Job had, uh, he's in the Bible. He's back in the Old Testament. And, and what's amazing about Job is he's like the wealthiest guy who ever lived. Certainly the wealthiest guy of his day. Very successful, vast estates. He had a big family. Too. Everything was going well for him. And then Everything turned upside down for, for Job. I mean, he lost, he filed, he, you know, he, he went bankrupt. He couldn't file for bankruptcy back then, but he lost his entire estate. Everything's gone, wiped out. His business is dried up. His kids are killed, his, his, his children, his family. His wife turns against him. Even his health goes. He has this incurable disease that's extraordinarily painful. And he has all the reason in the world to become resentful. But he doesn't. Because he, do, he, he processes all of that stuff that came his way a particular way. We're going to look at that. And if we do what Job does, we can have the same kind of result. In fact, the Bible says that his latter days were better than his former days. Again, because of the way he 
uh, he worked through the hurt that came into his life. So we're going to look at the cures, uh, the things that we do to help get through resentment. Before that, though, I want to look at what some of the causes, what people say about us certainly is something that causes us to get hurt, right? People hurt us. You have no troubles, yet you make fun of me. You hit a man who is about to fall. In other words, you're already in a bad place, and then come, people come, and they say stuff, and it, it, it messes with you, right? Now, we all learned that little nursery rhyme, you know, when we were kids, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, but that's not true, right? We, if I were to give you just, I don't know, 45, 50 seconds just to think about some of the things that were said to you as a kid, you can still remember the hurtful things that were said on the playground, in your home, all kinds of things, because it can be very, very, you know, it can be very hurtful, and we remember that. People say things about the way we walk, the way we look, the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we throw a ball, the way we write, the way we handle money, our political views, our spiritual views, the way we display our emotions or don't display our emotions, the way our body is shaped. I mean, I, the list just goes on, right? And we remember it and it hurts. We go, oh, that, that stung. And the closer somebody is to us, the more it hurts. So certainly that's a cause of resentment. And others, what people think about us. What, now, you say, well, I don't know what they think. Well, you know, actually, we do a lot of times. We can tell by the rolling of the eyes, the, the way, facial expression. Nonverbal communication is very, very powerful, and it can be, it can be a way of, of rejecting, rejecting you. You think you are better than I am and regard my troubles as proof of my guilt. So people accuse us of stuff. They reject us. They make us feel bad. And how somebody thinks about you does seep out. It certainly comes out in the way that they, that they treat us. Have you ever, have you ever had a, like a click at work that you were not part of? You know, they're part of the in-group, and often the click, they get like privileges that other people don't get. And so it's like, because a lot of times you think, well, I don't want to be part of that stupid click anyways. Well, not if they're getting special treatment, they're getting privileges. And you're not allowed, and that happens at work. It happens sometimes at church, unfortunately. It can happen in a home, where there's favoritism that's showered on one person and you're trying to get in that group or maybe, a, a, maybe all the kids but you. Or maybe you just have unpleasable parents. And no matter what you do, see, but it, it, can, it can hurt, no doubt about it, how, what people think about us, what people do to us, <clears throat> what do people actually do uh, certainly can impact us. Notice that verse there, it says, I ha- I, those I love most have turned against me. Somebody might have an affair, they steal from you, they destroy or ruin something that's yours, they lie to you, somebody hurts us, maybe even physically. And physical violence is certainly uh, on the rise. I looked up this week, National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and uh, actually it's, it's, it's on the rise. It's 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner that's here in America. That's 10 million men and women. One in three women and one in four men have experienced some form of physical violence by an intimate partner. That includes slapping, shoving, pushing, hitting, and of course, works. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So what people do to us, and it's not just physical violence. It can be spiritual violence. It can be emotional violence or, or, or abuse. I mean, all kinds of things that, that, that come our way by the way, what, how pe- what people do to us. So what do we do? Well, here, now the problem is, is that uh, resentment, if we take that hurt that people do to us and we turn it into, we, we let it kind of fester and it becomes resentment, it is unreasonable. That's, it says to worry yourself to death with resentment would be a foolish, senseless thing to do. In other words, it doesn't, resentment doesn't help. It really hurts us, so it's unreasonable. It's foolish to harbor a grudge, Ecclesiastes says. And so we can't change our past. That the things that happen to us are usually in the past. And so those become hurts. And if we, again, those can just become embittered in us. It starts to change the way we approach other people. And the Bible says that it's just, it's just dumb. Have you ever done something that you kind of regret? It's stupid or silly because you're reacting out of resentment? I think we've all done that, right? Here's one more verse, not on your outline. He was so bitter, he spoke without stopping to think. 
Sometimes that's us, right? We just get so upset, we don't really think it through. Then a resentment can be unhelpful because it's self-inflicting. You're only hurting yourself with your anger. When we let that stuff go, uh, we like resentment, go unbridled, it just, it hurts us. It hurts, it, it doesn't hurt, it hurts us more than it hurts anybody else. Remember those three stooges the, and that theologian, Curly, you know, where Curly goes up to Mo on one of these shows uh, and he says, uh, he goes, somebody kept hitting him in the chest. So he pulls open his coat. He goes, look, I've strapped dynamite to myself. So the next time that guy hits me, his hand will blow up. But of course, what makes that so stupid or funny is, is that he's going to, it's going to, more damage will happen to him, right? And that happens to us all the time. When, we, when we're thinking, well, you know, we have a shotgun and we point it to ourselves and we're, we shoot ourselves hoping that the kickback will hit the, and hurt the other person. But we get, we, we're, it damages us more than anybody else. Now, this kind of thing happens all the time when we use resentment in an unhelpful way. It happens in marriages, for example. In marriages, people will, uh, will they'll, they'll have some kind of hurt inflicted on them. They weren't shown appreciation. They weren't shown res, uh, respect or uh, and, and then they withhold affection. They think, oh, you know, and it's not like all oh, thought out, I'm going to get you back. You deserve some. Maybe it is that way sometimes. But, but that's our response because we get, re- we, and then it goes on. And, and, and we're hurting ourselves instead of trying to resolve that. It happens in, in the area of sex. Sex, a lot of times, uh, the, the, one, of the, one of the spouses will, not, will be hurt, and then they just shut down. They don't make themselves available for sex and then that hurts they're thinking well yeah you know they have reasons you know i'm hurt i'm but it's hurting it's this it's it's it turns into resentment hurts the other now, i know some of you are, i'm losing some of you already some of you are thinking andy you're a guy you're up here you're talking like a guy you're taking advantage of all the women at the ladies retreat you know you you know they're not there to correct you hey i am a guy can't change that but I also have done a lot of uh, talking to people over the years. I'm not a sex therapist. I don't want to be. But I've talked to a lot, of ther- a lot of people, and I'm telling you, sex is a big part of this. And, and, and it's beyond that. I'm just putting out sex because I want your attention. You know, I, I know I start talking about sex, everybody listens. <laughs> but it's, but if, so using the, the idea of sex, I mean, it, it happens all the time. But let me just say this. I know I'm a, I know I'm a guy, but... Marriages, in, when the couples are like in their 20s and 30s, that looks different than couples that are in their 50s or 60s. Okay? So, so it's real typical, no doubt, that the guy who's 25, sex is, you know, all important. And, and, uh, and that becomes, you know, sometimes a challenging issue to deal with in, in certain marriages. But let me just say that you roll the, the, the clock up 30 years, not assuming you're interested in staying married for life. But you roll the clock up 30 years, that, that often changes. That, that the guy is in a, in a different place in his life where they, you know, they, yeah, it's not all important anymore. And, uh, and sometimes then they get resentful. I've seen this many, many times with, with couples that have, are kind of be, a little beyond midlife type, you know, empty nesters or a little bit, and, and, uh, and, and they're resentful. This, the guy often is resentful from, from years of it being a different way and it wasn't available, and now all of a sudden his body's in a different place, and now he's not interested in being available. And so that often they won't say that, right? I mean, we all have good excuses. The stereotypical, you know, excuse... For the woman is, you know, I have a headache, right? I know it's stereotypical. But, you know, guys have their own. And when they're in, you know, they're, when they're older. And I don't want to get all into the details of it, but it's, it's often it's resentment. And it may be resentment from, you know, not, not being, making them, you know, making herself available when she was, it might, but it could be a hundred other things too. Just they're upset, you know, you just, the anger, they're frustrated, and they just shut that area down. Now listen, when you do that, you are hurting your marriage. You're killing your marriage when you do that kind of stuff. 
So you have to just think about it. I mean, there was, and, and it, maybe that's worth it to you. Maybe that's your self-destruct mode and you want out. You don't know any other way. But I am telling you, it's going, it's going to hurt you. Here, uh, the Bible talks about this issue of sex and marriage. It says, so don't refuse sex to each other unless you agree not to have sex. So what does that mean? It means that it, agree means two people, right? Well, I'm thinking we shouldn't have sex for several months. What do you think? No, I don't like that plan. Well, that's what he's talking about. Okay, you both, you both agree to not have sex for a little while. I'm not sure how long that is. I think he left it vague and per, on purpose, but it's a little. You can, like, circle little. In order to spend time in prayer, what do you need prayer for? Probably what you're upset about, right? You know, the stuff you're, you're, you're dealing with, the hurt. Yeah, I just need a few days, maybe a week or two to kind of, I'm not doing well with this going on, what's happening. Then Satan, so now see what he's saying is, is that you try to use, you let Satan, resentment get into your marriage, you're letting Satan into your marriage. So then Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So you say, well, yeah, self-control because you got, you know, sex on your mind all the time. Well, self-control includes a lot, actually. The Holy Spirit says that, I mean, the, in Galatians, it says the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So self-control would also be handling your hurt well. See, you know, not letting it turn into resentment. So enough said on that. I just wanted to say that resentment uh, is unhelpful. And then it is also unhealthy. It really is. It, 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 it hurts us. You know, more and more we're in a health-conscious society and often we focus on exercise and eating well. But let me say that the things that are hurting you the most are not what you're eating, but what's eating you, what's inside you. So you've got to be careful. Some, oh, uh, so, excuse me. Some men stay healthy. Now, we all want to stay healthy. Till the day they die. Whoa, I'm liking this. Others have no happiness at all. They live and die with bitter hearts. So he says it is connected. Your emotions are connected to your, your physical well-being, how you're doing. Same thing with your physical and your spiritual life. Your spiritual life's in the toilet. It is going to affect your physical life. There's no way around it because you are a spiritual person. A joyful, cheerful heart brings healing to both body and soul. So we need to deal with the hurts in our life so we don't let it rob us of the joy that God wants us to have. I read this quote this week. It said, it said resentment is hell in the heart. That's just inviting all of that garbage and Satan into our lives. And it just don't even go in that direction, right? Okay, so, well, what do we do? Well, if we look at Job, we see that he responded differently. He responded differently. And he he did these three things. Number one is he opened up about it. He revealed it. He said, hey, you know, I'm not going to pretend it's not there. It is there. It did hurt. And so he, is, uh, he reveals that. He says, I can't be quiet. And then he just comes out and he says, I'm angry and I'm bitter. I have to speak. So he says, he just opens it up. So often we will not do that. We just kind of close it up. We don't really, we're not vulnerable. We're not open with, with what we're going through. Listen to my bitter complaint. Don't condemn me, God. So now he goes to God and he says, God, this is what's going on in my life. I'm hurt. I've, I feel victimized. This stuff, I didn't ask for this. I didn't deserve this. It came out of nowhere. It's blindsiding me. I feel like I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop and two shoes drop. He goes, I'm just in this bad place. And he goes to God. Now, this is so important. Some of you need to do that. You need to go write a letter to God and say, God, this is, this is really painful for me because you're not, maybe you don't know how to communicate well in prayer like that. But you see it in the Psalms all the time. David's just open and raw. Hey, this is really painful. This is really hurting me. But this is an important part of it is going to God. Listen, it's, it, to me, it's the hardest. It's, as far as I can re, think, I thought about it. As far as I know, it's the hardest thing in my spiritual walk is going to God and sharing this stuff because there's a disappointment. Like, when you start to realize God loves me, he cares about me, he's all-powerful, he created the universe, he, he, can, you know, he, can, he can protect me, and, 
And, and yet I felt like this thing came at me and he, you know, like, what's up with that? You know, where was your protection? Where was that? And, and that becomes a very difficult thing in my relationship with the Lord. I'm not going to let it keep me from God because we all have things that we can, that we're disappointed with. Maybe you have a disability and you're saying, hey, I didn't ask for that. You know, maybe you have, a, you had a miscarriage and you lost a baby or you lost a child. Or you have, you're a victim of miscarriage of justice and something happened to you and, and, and you had, somebody took advantage of you and, 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 and as you start to reflect, you think, God, why, you know, why weren't you there for me? Why, why did you allow this happen? It becomes very difficult. But, and Job could, have, Job could have stayed there. This is not where we stay. This is where we begin. So you begin by well, being honest with God. Say, God, I need help. Now, listen, we actually have people that will pray with you and help you through some of this. And, you know, we have people that, you know, will you come on up and get, and get prayer. We also have more specialized prayer. We, we, it's called theophostic prayer, sozo prayer. It's, it's these prayer specialists that are really like counselors and that have put these programs together. We've been trained. We have a number of people that have been trained in this area. And, and we help you to kind of pray through some of that. Some of you need that. You know, I mean, how long are you just going to hold on to that hurt? Just let it keep robbing you of the life and the memories keep sabotaging you. I mean, at some point, you just got to say, time out, man. I need to do something. I need to, I need to do something different that I haven't tried before. So I invite you to, to get prayer. Listen, you also need to tell somebody else. Somebody else, you need to be able to tell them your whole story. And that's one of the reasons we encourage small groups, because in small groups, you can, you can really open up. I was talking to a, a guy about two weeks ago. He's telling me, he went to one small group, loved it and all, but then he went to another small group. He goes, he really, that's his place. I said, well, what's the difference? I mean, you know, what happened at this other small group? He goes, man, I just shared everything that I, you know, that was, that was going on in my life. And they just accepted me. I mean, it stayed there. They accepted me. They loved me. Through. And we all need that. We need a place. So you need, you need somebody who can stand with you. Unconditional love. They won't judge you. They just are going to, you know, you can just open up. You can share what's going on in your life. We all need that. It's all so important. So, again, you know, with small groups, if you're new to us in, 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 uh, in, in, at Vineyard, we do three semesters of small groups, and the, the, our small groups is, is going to be starting in just two weeks, our, our whole semester. Great time to get in, and uh, you register online if you'd like. That's, at, you know, on our website. Okay, so next so you, is to release the offender. To release the offender. In other words, you forgive him or her. Job did this. He didn't have to. I mean, here he had these friends that came to him and he didn't do anything wrong, and they're just they're they're you know accusing him and they misunderstand him. And there's nothing worse than being misunderstood, especially by people who you who should understand you, right? Your friends, your close people that are close to you. So he's you know, he's got all the stuff that really is offensive, is hurtful, and he, he doesn't stay there, right? I mean, he realizes, hey, I need, to, I need to forgive. God does a huge turnaround for Job. I mean, the, the end of his life looks totally different, and is actually, God does greater things. The, great, the end of his life is greater than the beginning of his life, and it happened because he was willing to release his offender after Job prayed for these three friends. Isn't that amazing? So when did God start to t- change things in Job's life? After he prayed for them. He, he, and he prayed for their success. This is, a, this is remarkable to be able to, to pray for, but Jesus said that, right? Pray for those who, who despitefully use you. He says this is, this is important that we, you know, how we deal with the hurt that happens, you know, in our life. So he says there, uh, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. Now, he still lost those things that he had lost. Those were still important to him. But God wasn't done with him. He was, and Job wasn't going to let his past dictate his future. And so he, was, so he revealed it up front. Hey, this is what I'm going through. This is where I'm at. And then he goes and he offers forgiveness. This is very difficult to do, right? Very, very difficult to forgive somebody uh, because everything in us says, well, you don't deserve it. 
And it's, is that true? They don't deserve it. It is true, right? It, they don't deserve it. it. It doesn't feel right. But that's why we need God. We need God's help to do that. Say, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to just stay in this place where I'm always, every time those memories, they just keep coming back, they keep hurting me, and they affect my other relationships. How often should we forgive? Well, Peter asked Jesus that question. He said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? That certainly sounds magnanimous. I mean, somebody hurts you, right? Okay, I've, you know, you muster up, I forgive you. Then they hurt you again? For the sake of argument, let's say it's the same thing, right? I, okay, I forgive you. Same thing again. I for, seven times, sounds, that sounds pretty amazing in my book, right? Jesus actually says, well, I'm looking for something bigger. Jesus says, not seven times, but 70 times seven, 490 times. In other words, it's, it goes on and on and on. It's continual. Forgiveness is something that's continual. You see, there's something, I think, in, the Christ, in some Christian circles that it's this idea that you only forgive once, you know? You, you, you kind of think about some offense and you forgive that person. Okay, that's done. But that's really not the way it works. The way it works is the memory comes back, the pain comes back, the hurt comes back, the wounding, all of that is so real, you need to forgive again. So often one offense that's bad can take time and time. It's continual over and over and over. You just forgive again. You just forgive again. And you know you need to forgive when you don't feel like forgiving. Right? When you feel like, I'm ready to forgive them, that's, you're probably done. You're good to go now. It's, it's when we don't feel like it, because we don't. I never feel like, oh, I feel like forgiving that person. Wow, they, that really hurt, and they certainly deserve forgiveness. No, I never have those feelings, right? It's painful. I don't want to. How do you know when you're done forgiving? When you can remember it, and it's not, it doesn't hurt anymore. You can understand where they're coming from. You can be in their presence, and you're calm. It doesn't affect you. So you forgive. It's got to be continual because God wants to do something in your life. And if you let, uh, you let that continue to go on in your life, it becomes resentment. It becomes something that is a, a problem. I read this story about uh, Clara Barton. She's the founder of the American Red Cross. Somebody had hurt her very deeply. And uh, years later, she's talking about this guy who had hurt her to a friend of hers in very kind terms. And so the lady, the lady stops her. She goes, well, wait a minute. Isn't that the person who hurt you really bad? And here's what she said. She goes, I, she goes yes. She goes, but I distinctly remember forgetting that hurt. So it's not that you don't remember it, but you choose to not remember. Hey, I'm, I'm choosing not to remember the hurt. I'm going to move on with my life. I'm not going to let that derail me. And then lastly, refocus your life. So this is so important because what you focus, what you face towards is what you go towards. And whatever you, if, sometimes people say, well, I'm never going to be like my mom. She, I'm never going to be like my dad. What are you thinking the whole time? You're, you know, you're reinforcing even though it's negative and then you start to become like them and you see little glimpses of it or somebody tells you that and you go, no, because you, you have to refocus. You can't just resist something. Whatever you resist, persist. If, if you have your hand out and I push against your hand, you're going to naturally like push back, right? That's our natural inclination. So if you're going to deal with your emotions, you have to do it differently. A lot of people say, oh, I need to get healed on my emotions. Then I, can, then I can do, you know, what I'm supposed to do with my life. Well, that's actually not what we see here. It says here, notice, here's the three things that, that, Job, that Job recommends. Put your heart right, reach out to God, then face the world again, firm and courageous. Those three things. Put your heart right. You can do what you, need, you know you need to do. i, I got to put my heart right. I'm going to do what God says, even though I don't feel like it, even though I don't feel like forgiving. And then he says, reach out to God. You see, human ability is only so much. In our own human ability, we can't really forgive like we need to. It turns into resentment. That's why we reach out to God. So you reach out to Jesus and you say, God, I need your help. Help me out. You fill me up. You give me the ability to walk this out. So you put your heart right. You face, you reach out to God, and then you face your future again. You face, you face life. You go out and face the world. You say, hey, I'm not going to clam up. Because when we get hurt, 
What's the tendency? I'm done with that. No more trusting anybody. I'm never going to be vulnerable again. I'm never going to open up my heart like that again. Because that person took advantage of me. And, you know, shame on them the first time, shame on me the second, you know, all the, and, and there's some truth to, the, you know, we want to be wise, but often we just start building walls instead of building bridges. Saying, hey, I want to, you know, that was somebody else. I'm not going to hold that against you. So we refocus our life. And then what happens, I love this, then after the, those other things happen, see, got his heart right, reached out to God, face the world, then all your troubles will fade from your memory like floods that are past and remembered no more. That's the kind of God, uh, life God wants for us. And I want you to, you're not going to be just trapped in those memories and those hurts and all of the pain of that. It's not going to just totally derail your other relationships. It says, I have something better for you. But it does mean you have to courageously forgive somebody. I mean, that's really the heart of a big part of what we're talking about today, right? I mean, Corey Ten Boom, I don't know if you know her story. She was uh, back in the Nazi concentration camp. Day. I mean, she hid Jews in her apartment. The Nazis came, put all of the Jews in a concentration camp and her family. And her family, they were all killed. And she was tortured. All kinds of terrible things happened to her. She was the only one to survive. After the war, one of the things she did first was go and find the guards. And she went and forgave each one of them. How do you do that? That's only something God can do in your life. When we have deep, wounded pains, deep pains in our lives, you need something supernatural. You need something bigger than what you've got going on. Let's close with this verse here. It says here, uh, you don't resist a feeling, you have to replace it. In other words, you can't just resist it. We already talked about that. The last verse, God blessed the last part of Job's life even more than he blessed the first. That's God's plan for you. He goes, I want to bless the last part of your life. See, what matters more than where you've done in the past, where you've been, what's happened to you, is where your feet are pointed right now. Where are you, what, what direction are you going? Because that's the part that God wants to bless. Okay, so let's go to prayer. I'll lead you in a prayer, and then I'm going to invite you to kind of embrace these three things. Okay? Well, Lord, we just invite you right now into this space, Lord. I know that probably everybody here has had some pretty deep woundings. And we haven't always handled it real well. And we know that. Things people have said about us. Somebody said something about your personality or the way you look or a comment about your intelligence or your social behavior. Maybe you've been rejected verbally or maybe just non-verbally, which is sometimes even worse. You don't even have the guts to say something. <coughs> maybe the way somebody's done something to you. There's plenty of wounds out there. And so I'm going to pray with you that you would take that stuff, certainly the stuff that happens to us in the future, because there's more to come, unfortunately. I mean, the good news is God has a pathway for us to process the hurt if we take him up on it, to recognize that, you know what, if I let this, if I don't deal with this, it's going to become resentment, and resentment only hurts me. It's un it makes no sense. It hurts me. It destroys my marriage. It destroys the people I care about. It ruins relationships. It really starts to create a dark cloud over my future. You say, God, I don't want that. I don't want that. And so it begins right now with revealing yourself. Just revealing your, where you're at. The disappointments you have. And you go to God. I mean, certainly that's the first place. You say, God, man, that hurts. I feel like I lost so much in this deal. If you think of the person who, you know, you're most offended at or what, who's coming to your mind right now, just kind of take that moment there and just say, God, with your help, I need to forgive that person. 
I need to forgive. I need to let them off. I know you, they don't deserve it, but I can't live with that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust that you are going to mete out justice as you see appropriate in this life or the next. Sometimes we just can't do that on our own. So that's when we just reach out to God. And so I'm going to invite you to do that right now. Just say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. Let your love flood into my heart. Would you say, God, you just say it to God. Say, you give me the grace to forgive. You do it. I can't do it. And then help me to face the world fresh and new, not building barriers up, not recoiling into my hole behind the wall. Help me to live a life that knows how to process hurt so that I can have warm relationships. We pray this in Jesus' name. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.